Okay, well, a little background on Peter, if you guys, uh, any of you guys who are unfamiliar with Google, um, the interesting thing about Peter's career is that he's kind of done it all. Started out as an artist uh, and a singer-songwriter with a band, uh, and he successfully made the move into being a producer, and then also, oddly enough, into being a very successful manager. So I think it's a kind of a career path that I, I don't really know of any parallels in the business. Can you think of any other people who've done as much in all three of those areas? Uh, not off the top of my head, yeah, no. Me but, neither. But, but yeah, I've, I've enjoyed doing all the different aspects of it. Well, that was my th the question I thought was really going to be incisive. And being a record company as well, of course. Uh, yes, right. In a couple company. of different levels as well. The last time I said, what was your favorite of all those jobs? And I remember you were like, well, I like different things about about each of those jobs. Yeah, I think if I, if I had to pick one, it would be producing records, which is the one that currently I, I, st I do the most of. But, but I certainly enjoyed, I mean, you know, m my period, my 30 years, whatever it was as a manager, I enjoyed enormously. And then, you know, and then I've run t been responsible to two record companies over time. One was when I was head of A&R for Apple Records, which was entirely different from being a se senior vice president of Sony some 20 years <laughs> yeah. later. You know, they could experience... One of them was more corporate, maybe, than the other? Just ever so slightly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's funny. Now, um, when you started, uh, that band, your, your band was very songwriter-oriented, and you, were, you and your partner were the, the, the songwriting machine of that outfit. Right. No, uh, actually, no, not really. Uh, Peter and Gordon started, um, you know, p purely singing other people's songs. But the important thing to remember is so did everybody else. I mean, one of the things that I talk about in my show is that, you know, you have to remember the Beatles began, as, as we all did, as essentially tribute bands to American music. We weren't singing, let alone not singing our own songs, we weren't singing any English songs at all. Um, it was all about how much we loved American rock and roll. And, and we would learn songs and, uh, from American records when we could get hold of them. That's why the whole thing was such a miracle, really, the so-called British invasion, um, which was a very successful invasion. <laughs> but the ammunition and artillery we used in that invasion was all yours, not ours. You know? And what were the records you bought when you were, how old were you when you first started getting into American music and digging up those records? You must have been pretty young. Probably. I'm trying to think which came first. I mean, I certainly bought Rock Around the Clock, Bill Haley, so whatever, when, when that was, 57, 57, so I would have been 13. But I'd bought records before that. Um, you know, I grew up in a, a musical household. My mother was a classical musician. She was oboe professor at the Royal Academy of Music up the road. So my, the first music I would have been listening to growing up certainly was all classical. But... Um, I think either Rock Around the Clock or an English record that you won't know probably called Rock with the Caveman by Tommy Steele um, might have been the first single I ever bought. A very fine song. Uh, Tommy Steele, some of you might remember, because he went on from being a rocker, then he became like a, um, a musical star. He was in... Uh, theater, various musical theater? Uh, uh, musical theater, musical movies. Mm. There's actually a couple of hit American musicals that he's in. Um, half a sixpence, I think was one of them. So, but so he became. That one. Is that on Netflix? <laughs> he became. I'm sure it is. He became like a you know quote all round entertainer. But back then, his first hit was "Rock with the Caveman," uh, not a very sophisticated song, written however by none other than Lionel Bart, who went on to write huge hit musicals like Oliver. But your band had kind of more of a folk rock. Yeah, slant. we would do that. We would do. S we would do Buddy Holly songs, we would do folk songs, we did a version of 500 Miles, which is pretty much what got us our record deal. Um, and of course, we'd do tons of Everly Brothers songs because there were two of us, it was obvious. I mean, every duo that's ever assembled in the history of music uh, looks to the Everly Brothers as, 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 the, as good as you can get. And at the time, of course, um, I thought they were wholly original, that there was nothing like the Everly Brothers. Then once I got my country music, education, largely compliments of Linda Ronstadt, of whom more later, who pretty much was the person who introduced me to country music. I discovered the Leuven brothers and all the other people who'd, who'd pioneered that kind of singing. But, but we looked on the Everlies, as did Paul and John, as did almost every duo in the world, as, as as good as you can get, and we tried to sound like them. So those, that's, those were your big influences? Were I think so, yes. But as I say, what was interesting, it was, it was all American. Um, 
an interesting thing happened actually only a few years ago, which is, you know, because most people start off imitating somebody else, yeah. or doing their best to do so. And it's, it's just important to pick good people to imitate. And the Everly Brothers are very good. So we were trying to sound like the Everly Brothers and failing, but in the process of failing, coming up with a sound that people actually liked. And I remember it was only quite recently that David Crosby, who I've known forever and ever and ever, told me, and I, and I was talking about, well, I assume um, when you guys were, were, were singing together, um, when him and... Um, um, Graham Nash? Uh, no, no, no. No, no, no. I'm talking about uh, Birds at the very beginning. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, okay. Crosby and Chris Hillman. Yeah. When he and Chris Hillman were singing harmony parts together, I said, I assume you were trying to sound like the Everly Brothers. And he went, no, 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 no. He said, we were trying to sound like you guys. <laughs> because at the time, of course, the time they formed the Birds, it was cool to be an English band. Right. So they were trying to copy us while we were trying to copy the Everly Brothers. In neither case did we succeed. But we sounded, ended up sounding like Peter and Gordon, and they ended up sounding like the birds. So Which I is said, the beauty of it, right? I said to David, really? I mean, we actually can, could be considered to have contributed some minute something to the sound of the birds. He went, oh, definitely, yes. I went, oh, my God, that's so cool. That's, I was, those are some of my favorite very, records very of all time. very pleased with myself. That's, you should be. That's a great compliment. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, do you... So, but you did get into writing songs with... You guys wrote some originals. We did. We never wrote a hit. Um... We tried, but, but most of our hit records were written by various other people. So we wrote quite a number of songs, and I've continued to do that over the years. So you still write now, and that was going to be my question, is if you still write now, and do you often maybe co-write with artists that you're producing, or how does the writing come about yes, for you? Yes, yes. Um, in some cases, I do. I did an, uh, one of the more obscure albums I've done, which was not a hit in America, was with a, a singer called Amanda Marshall. I don't know if any of you oh. know who she is. But she's an incredibly great Canadian singer. Amazingly soulful and good. And very big in Canada, but only had like one hit, I think, in America. But I did an album with her that I co-produced with a guy called Billy Mann, who's a very good songwriter. And the three of us wrote all the songs on that album. And uh, that's one that when people ask me, you know, what's the album you're most proud of that nobody knows and didn't sell, that's the one. Um, I think I have that record, because I have one of her records. It's called home. Everybody's Got a Story. I got the other one. Yeah, exactly. You got, you got, the, one, you got the one with the hit on it. There was, <laughs> one, there was one hit. But oddly enough, um, songwriting still creeps into my life. Most recently, and I know we're jumping about here, if that's, that's okay fine. jumping decades. But I'm doing a lot of work with Hans Zimmer, which I can talk about at length later, I'm in movie music world, working on various soundtrack projects. Right now we're in the middle of Batman. I mean, it's Batman, Superman. Batman's done. <laughs> we're in the middle of the new Superman movie, which the movie is astounding. I mean, we, we had to sign all these bits of paper saying we won't tell anybody about anything, but I'm sure I can say it's awesome. Without this is just our it. little secret. We can just, just and, a couple uh, of guys talking. But we were in London scoring it, and the score, Hans has outdone himself. The score is colossal. I'll... Uh, to digress for yet another moment, we did a session two weeks ago with 12 drummers, um, which you don't do every day anyway. Drummers don't you usually even know e play with each other at all. So we had 12 of the best drummers in the world all on a studio soundstage, an orchestral soundstage, recording them like an orchestra. So they were all individually mic'd and we had you know overheads for the whole room. And we had people like you know Sheila E., was playing drums. Vinnie Cayuda was playing drums. J.R. Robinson was playing drums. Jason Bonham was playing drums. Pharrell Williams was playing drums. I mean, seriously. Nobody else could make a record anywhere this, in the world that day. Exactly. This was, this was the real thing. And and um, uh, what are the other? I forget all the other. The guy from uh, um, Slipknot. No, no, no. The, the, I mean, we had all these. Incredible. Jason was amazing. I'd never worked with him before. He was colossally good. But we had all these amazing drummers. I mean, the, the major drummers you could get, all playing this thundering stuff that Hans had written for Superman. So so when you... Uh, and, and we did some sampling stuff, of course, too. So when you see Superman, you know, and he takes off, there's this, this, this huge thundering noise happens, and you know, in fact, that spread around your head in the 5-1 mix is all the best drummers in the world. That was fun. Oh, I bet. Anyway, what was my point? My point was, um, back when we were doing uh, 
uh, Madagascar 3, which was really fun. I didn't know the Madagascar movies at all. You may well not, probably not having children of the appropriate age, but um, I hadn't seen one before, so I went back and watched one and two, and they're actually very clever, very smart, very funny movies. And we were doing three, and we were doing some scoring in London, and my, I brought my friend Dave Stewart in, who's um, mm. a great friend of mine. I'm sure you know all his work from the Rhythmics and beyond. And we've been friends for a long time. In fact, when I won, one of the two times I won Producer of the Year Grammy, it was presented to me by Dave Stewart, whom I know, and Lou Reed, whom I don't know. <laughs> so it was about as cool a duo as you could get. <laughs> but uh, we were doing the score, and the, the, the movie people, on these dates, there's always a, a lot of movie people. Movie people never come in ones. There's always, like, you know, a producer, an executive producer, a music supervisor, a, there's a whole committee of them. And they were saying, well, at this point in the film, um, we want a, a, a love ballad. There's going to be a, a, we want a theme for when Alex the Lion, just in case anyone has seen it, falls in love with Gia the Lioness, which is Ben Stiller and Jessica Chastain. Uh, they fall in love doing this trapeze act, and we want a, a love song there that's going to reoccur over the end credits. Um, so Dave Stewart and I, uh, at the end of the session, decided that we'd go and write one, try and get the job. So we went off that night, had a couple of vodka martinis, and, and um, Dave makes extremely good martinis, in addition to his musical talents. He prides himself on his martini making. And, um, and we wrote this song. Uh, and interestingly, with a movie, you kind of know what you're aiming for, because they always have a temp one in there. And what they were using as the temp one, actually, was uh, Dean Martin's Amore. You, which you probably remember, you know, that's the, when the love hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's, a, so we, that was, so we knew it had to be a waltz because they're all on the trapeze, and we knew the theme was falling in love all of a sudden. So we went off and wrote this song called Love Always Comes as a Surprise in, in 3-4, and um, played it to them the next day, and they liked it, and uh, then they tried it, you know, and just that, uh, we'd done the rough version on Dane, on Dave's uh, iPhone. <coughs> and they said, great, you know, we'd like to put that in, so go ahead and make a record of it. So I went back to LA, produced the track, again, t taking some cues from the Dean Martin record, put lots of like, you know, balalaikas and mandolins and stuff that it's that, if you remember Amore, it's all little, 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 it's all that stuff. And so we put some of that in, and uh, I recorded it properly and then did a demo vocal. Um, and they tried that in the movie, used it in some of the test screenings. And then there was a big meeting about who should we get to sing the song. And it was actually Jeffrey Katzenberg, who you probably know as the big cheese of DreamWorks. And uh, Jeffrey said, this sounds fine. Peter should sing it in the movie. So I went, oh, you know, thank you, Jeffrey. You're the <laughs> boss. And um, <laughs> so if you, in the event you, any of you do get the DVD of Madagascar 3, that is one of the most recent songs I've written. And not only that, but one of my rare appearances as a lead singer. So uh, there I am in Madagascar 3. But that's the... <laughs> <laughs> well, you should listen to it before you applaud. You might hate it. But, um, but that's the most recent, my more recent work that's, that's been released as a writer is having a song that Dave and I wrote on Madagascar 3. So uh, it's a very long answer to a short question, which I'm afraid some of these may turn out to be. No, but, that's the point. But uh, so that, that's uh, my last uh, successful writing experience. The miracle was that the movie people liked it because the other thing about movie people, especially on giant budget sequel movies, is they second guess each other all the time. It's amazing they didn't have like three songs written by three different people and yeah. try them all out at test screenings and they do crazy stuff like that all the time. Which is not how records were made back at a different point in time or movies. Right. Um, but getting end title, end title is awesome. That's like the best placement you can get for a song. Well, exactly, and of course, the tragedy is, or I would have been pointing out that we, were, we, that we got nominated for an Oscar, we didn't. We picked the wrong year, because you may remember the previous year, there were incredibly few decent songs up for, up for an Oscar. That was the time when they only had two nominated, you remember? Whereas this year, of course, we already knew there was Adele with the Bond song. Oh, yeah. It was Hugo Jackman with Les Mis, yeah. where they'd written an, a brand new song, 
primarily to make sure they could get a nomination. Because Les Mis, as such, would not be eligible because you, the only songs that are eligible are songs written specifically for a movie and first released in the movie. Mm -hmm. So they'd given Hugh Jackman one new big dramatic song so that they could be nominated. We still don't know who's going to win, of course, but but uh, we were on the... They, they put out a list of the 60 eligible songs. So we made Dave and I made it that far. <laughs> but that was... <laughs> That was as far as we got. When the five nominated songs came out, we were not among them, nor did we expect to be, to be honest. Because also, the other quirk is that people are less interested in terms of nominations in sequels. The exception mm. being Bond. Because Bond, the song for the Bond movie has become a, like a big thing in and yeah. of itself. So people do pay attention to each one when it comes out. But generally, if you want to get an Oscar nomination for any aspect of a movie, do the first one. Did you like the Adele they, once Bond Once the first thing? one's out, people tend to ignore the, f the sequels. What? Did you like the Adele Bond song? I did. I mean, I didn't think it was genius. But, I mean, the Bond thing is a miracle. And if you think about it, there's so many good songs. I mean, going back to Shirley Bassey and yeah. Goldfinger. That's my favorite amazing. one. amazing. Yeah. But, I mean, Live and Let Die is not a bad fucking yeah. song, for God's yeah, sake. That's a and really good song. <laughs> I was thinking about that title. How could you write a bad song with a title like that? You <laughs> think of that title and... Live and I mean, let yeah, die, and it's great. It's so great. And and then uh, Kali is one of Kali's best songs. Remember, she wrote "Nobody Does It Better" for a Bond movie, and that's a great song. Yeah. So the Bond thing has become, you know, a thing in and of itself. That that's always going to get nominated. And they've had some really. Oh, and even the Duran Duran one was great. You remember that? No. View to a kill. It's called oh. View to a Kill, and it was great. No, that I, did I like, like Duran Duran anyway, but that was a great song. I remember being disappointed by the. Was it? Uh, Cheryl Crow did one? Yeah, that was lame. Yeah, that I was good. Yeah. And I th also, I had high expectations. I thought, because I'm a fan, I thought it would be really good. I love Cheryl Crow, but, yeah, that but was um, she's just written the music for my friend Barry Levinson's musical. Really? Um, it'll be her first appearance on Broadway, which I'm not sure when it, it's going to open, but Barry has long had ambitions of turning his movie Diner. Um, which I hope some of you have seen, a classic movie. Oh. Um, Launched so many careers, too, actor-wise. Yes. So he's turning Diner into a musical, and uh, Sheryl Crow's written the music. And I've heard it, it's great, but I'm not sure when it's opening on Broadway. What stuck with me from Diner is the guy who would quiz his girlfriend on obscure R&B titles from the singles from, That's from the right. 50s, and if she got them wrong, he'd be just rageful at her. Don't yes. you know <clears throat> who wrote the Orioles hit from 1955 called, you know, blah, blah, or Yes, whatever. yes. Yeah. Great actors. Um, okay, random question. Name an artist from the past you wish you would have worked with that maybe you, you missed the chance to work with. Is there anyone that you've always thought, oh, that's the one that got away? Wow. Uh, there's so many of them. I mean, see, half the time you, you fall in love with an artist because they make a great record, and then you might, might wish that you'd produced that record, but that's not quite the same thing because if you'd produced them, it wouldn't have been the same. It might, might not have been as good. You know? In other words, there's all kinds of artists and records that I admire greatly from the past, but the fact that they made that brilliant record probably means they had the right producer and that me doing it would have been interfering. But... Um, I That's the nicest answer I've ever heard, by the way. That, was, that deserves applause just <laughs> for being so nice. Why aren't Americans like that? It's like I, Canadians I, are like that. The British are like that. It's just, all pretense. We're really... We're just, I know, but still, just making the effort. We're just as pleased with ourselves as everybody else. But, <laughs> but you try this facade of, of, of a little humbleness, and it works well. That's what we need more. We're more facade. Write that down. Um... Uh, anyway, what n give me give me one name? Uh, oh uh, gosh, a, a singer that you always wish you would have worked with. Uh, Dusty Kurt Springfield. Ah, um, one of my favorite voices of all time. I met her a few times. I didn't know her well. Nobody did. She was very yeah. private. But um, yes, I would have killed to work with Dusty Springfield. I mean, she was in a sense almost before my time because you know those the giant great hits were when I, before I was a record producer, but. Um, you know, if there was somebody you could just immediately have brought back to life and make a record with them, it would be her. How about uh, someone current? Anyone out there right now that you've thought about, boy, that would be really fun to produce well, that band know, or artist? Well, I'd love to produce somebody like Bruno Mars because I think he's a genius, but he makes such great records himself. Yeah. You know, he's a writer and a producer and a singer and a nice guy. I've met him um, only because my daughter knows him. She, her, the band she's in and Bruno have worked together on, on tour and stuff. And, and, uh, 
he seemed totally great in every respect, you know. So I'd, I'd love to work with him, but d do you honestly think he needs me? No. <laughs> I did hear his newest song I, I heard on the radio the other day, and it sounds like it was recorded at Stax. I really? mean, like, yeah, note for note, and it's a, it's a, it's not a great song, but it's a very good song. But as far as the sonic values of it, it's like right there. Yeah, and he's produced some other people brilliantly as yeah. well. I mean, he's he's the real thing. He's, I mean, it's because it's funny. I, I still run into a lot of people who go, oh, you know, from the '60s. Oh, the music was so much better then, and the songs were so great, and you guys were so great. There was tons of crap back in the '60s, just like just like there is now, and the idea that you know. You, that though they don't write songs like that anymore, it's total nonsense. There's great, great stuff out there now. Some great musicians and great producers and everything. I like that though. I noticed that last time. You don't tend towards nostalgia. You have fond memories, but you're not one of those, you know, things were better back in the day guys. No, which they there weren't. are a lot of people I mean, like that. In some respects they were people paid for records. That was nice. But but uh, I remember that. <laughs> One gets, awesome. one gets nostalgic for that concept. But, but uh, other than that, no. Musically, I'm not nostalgic at all. Yeah. No, I'm not either. Um, so let's talk about this. You're working on a, um, an upcoming record. What, uh, was it Elton's idea to do a, a, a version of, of the album Goodbye Yellow Brick Road with, with current singers? Yes, I think it was his idea or, or something he and the label came up with collectively. But... Uh, Yes, he, he called me. I mean, we're friends. I've known him forever and ever and ever. Um, he was actually reminding me, we had lunch last week, and he reminded me of the story that when he very first played the Troubadour, which was uh, the first time I met him, I didn't know him back in London, and um, the very first Troubadour one, he and I, we'd met the night before. I think we knew each other through somebody, and I'd invited him over, and he and the band all came over to, over to my house, and what he reminded me of, which I forgot, was that James Taylor was there and Kate Taylor, James's sister, were there as well. And they all spent the day uh, out of my house because I had a swimming pool. And I think whatever motel they were staying in at the time didn't have a pool. I and mean, which is inconceivable now when you think that I'm sure Elton never stays in a hotel room that doesn't have a pool, <laughs> <laughs> let alone a hotel. Um, a pool in the shape of Elton John. It went exactly. Uh, he, um, but uh, yeah, he called me up and said, that Universal and he had this thing that it's the 40th anniversary of Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, believe it or not, which came out in 1973. And so we are try we're gonna re-record uh, seven or eight or as many as I can talk Universal into paying for um, of those tracks uh, in new versions by new contemporary artists. Can you talk about who's on yet? I suppose I can. Um, uh, Maroon 5 are doing the song Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. That's confirmed. Um, can't, when Candle in the Wind, I'm, I'm sp maybe I'm not supposed to be saying this, I don't know, but Candle in the Wind we're doing with Ed Sheeran. Do you all know who Ed mm -hmm. Sheeran is? Yeah. He is so great. He's amazing. I mean, I loved his record the minute I heard it. I thought he was amazing. I heard uh, The A-Team and then I heard um, uh, Lego House. And... He's completely brilliant. Then I went to see him live because I went to Nashville last week to meet with him to talk about this and saw him live. He's unbelievably good. I mean, because it's just him and a guitar and he does all the, the loop stuff, you know, with the loopy pedal and things like that. But he does it so much better than... I mean, I've, I love what Katie Tunstall does, but he leaves her in, the, in, in, in behind. I mean, he does the most creative, amazing stuff, creating these huge tracks... Because he, you know, using the guitar to make a kick drum, um, sort of a la Rodrigo and Gabriella, who I've also worked with, who are my guitar heroes. Um, and then does some sort of human beatbox stuff on top of that, and then some guitar stuff on top of that. Creates this fantastic wall of sound. And then sings and plays on top of it brilliantly and dances around the stage, hitting the pedal at the exact right moment to, to make single beats and gaps and stuff. And then he'll do a song completely just on his own with the guitar and bring the house down. He's an incredible singer. And I mean, I mean in fact, he and Bruno Mars would be the ultimate duet because they're both just unbelievably good at everything. Who um, else is going to be on the record besides... So time. he's doing it, the two of them. We're talking to, you know, as it were, all the usual suspects. We're talking to Lady Gaga, who's an Elton friend and fan, to Katy Perry, to... Um, you know, I'm trying to talk Taylor Swift into doing all the young girls love Alice because I think sung Ooh, by sung edgy. by sung by a young girl it assumes a whole other 
slightly sleazier aspect that I find very appealing. But I, I have a feeling... It's high that, time. I think but it's I have a feeling time. that Mr. and Mrs. Swift may not feel the same way. <laughs> and, and mom and dad play a big role in that career. <laughs> but, um, but I think Taylor Swift is a bit underrated, actually, because she's not the world's greatest singer. But my God, she's a good songwriter. She does what a good songwriter does, which is write what she knows about and write it really well and clearly the songs mean a lot, make perfect sense. And I think because she's so hugely successful, people actually underrated a bit. I mean, the fact that she's been writing these cool songs for several years now is quite something. Are they going to get anyone like a country artist to sing Roy Rogers or some of the... Because that album is like... I mean, it takes you around the world with Jamaica and all the different... We've looked at that, of course. Yeah. And if you... It, absolutely, we have. But you, um, None of the... None of the the, what I just told you is set in stone. So we're, there's lots of people we're talking to, you know. Um, it's, it's hard, you know. Well, it's a great idea, and well, it's, there's, that there's, record there's no, is... There's nobody we don't want. There's not enough songs to go around. And, of course, mm. you know, if someone like Eminem comes in and joins us, he can take take and rewrite and re-rap any damn song he wants. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's eminently flexible. I've got to deliver everything by the end of May, so... As soon as I get back home, that is priority number one. If, in fact, I have phone calls to make when I get back today to, to follow well, up. Well, what fun. Me. It's great fun. No, no, it's very flattering and, uh, and great to be asked, you know. Because I was out the first time Elton called. So, I mean, I confess, you know, you don't get blasé when you get old. You know, when you play back your messages and there's a couple of boring ones and the next one is, hi, this is Elton. You go, holy shit, it's <laughs> Elton. <laughs> you know. You're still, it's still as cool as it ever, as you, it's, it, you know, it's getting a phone message from Elton, it's just as cool as you think it would be. I bet you're glad you how, let him how, use your swimming pool. However long you've known him, you still can't help but go, kind yeah. of go whoa, really? That's cool. Well, it's just <laughs> such a, that's like one of the first albums I ever shoplifted, and I, I still have my copy of it. That and um, Captain, Fant or Captain Fantastic right after, I mean, that, that's like Gus Yeah, well, I, was, I went stuff. to that first show at the Troubadour, you know, which was the first time he came to LA and just blew everybody away. By the end of one week, he was a, the biggest star in L.A. Everybody was trying and to And that go. was just trio? It was all about the piano and the burn down the mission? and the kind Yes, of it was trio, quartet, I guess, because, yeah, guitar, bass, drums, piano. Wow. He had guitar there for sure. But in, in a way, of course, it was like, you know, James Taylor's first week at the Troubadour, or what people think was his first week, which was actually his second. You know, the week we did with Carol King and Danny Korchmar and so on at the Troubadour, which, that, which was the one I recreated and reproduced two years ago or whatever it was mm -hmm. for that Carol and James back at the Troubadour. But we'd actually played the Troubadour once before with James on his own to a half-empty house, but that one seems to have left the history books. I like the shows, though, where there's a, you were there and there was only 20 people there, but it gets to be legendary, and 10 years later, you know 500 people who swear they were there and saw it. Oh, yeah, the it. people who were... The, the, the James and Carol one at the Troubadour, um, you know, I've talked to so many people who were there. Well, it's just like the number of people at Woodstock. I mean, there were a lot of people <laughs> there. But if everyone who says they were there were there, it would, it would have to hold, you know, 20 million. You know? Yeah. One but of them was I, me. I, I was totally at Woodstock. I was, I, was, I was there. You were there? I was at Woodstock, yes. Did you have a good time? Uh, yes. I mean, it, it was all to do with getting in, which is hard because, you know, the, the traffic was crazy and all that stuff. Finally, you had to bullshit your way into one of the helicopters, which was the only way to get there. Uh, and the only artists in their immediate circle were there. And uh, so we got on the helicopter, and I spent one day. Uh, so, But, I mean, I wouldn't want to be out in the audience. You know, the joys of wallowing in the mud is n would be lost on me, even when I was young. Yeah. And um, But I was backstage. The terrible thing is, and I'll tell you, it's a, a weird psychological phenomenon, that I realized I'm no longer entirely certain, when I l think back, who I saw from standing on the side of the stage and who I saw in the movie. You know what I mean? Because we've all seen the Woodstock movie so many times and there's so many great performances. I know I saw Richie Havens from the side of the stage and then I know he's also in the movie. But there's other bits and pieces of it where I'm actually blurred together. You know how they talk about this false memory business and on, you know how eye testimony is so unreliable. I'm, some people I go, I've seen it, but I'm not sure if I saw it because I was there that day or because... It was in the uh, movie. But the only, what my only other interesting celebrity sighting was that we had procured, in addition to this helicopter ride, we got a, a motel room, which was really hard to get. 
I'd got a key from some artist who had an extra key. So we had a room because it was impossible to get out of there. We got back to the hotel and the place was, of course, packed and there were people sleeping in the lobby and it was the whole, it was, the whole thing was chaos. And I was walking down the corridor to my room and somebody was passed out lying across the corridor. And as I stepped over them, I looked down and realized it was Janis Joplin. And went, <laughs> whom I never met, but I did step over her once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was weird because I just know what I've read, but some accounts say that some people at Woodstock were, you know, taking drugs. And I, I, it's unsubstantiated, but I don't know if that might color the experience or... Actually, I don't think I, I think I was sober as a judge at Woodstock, as far as I can remember. Well, I mean, we were smoking dope, but that doesn't count. But, um, uh, nice. <laughs> but I don't think we took any seriously mind-bending drugs, though, men, though many did. I mean, other times I did, but not then. Santana's drummer, Michael, what's his face? He was like 17, his first trip, and he did the Soul Sacrifice drum solo. Oh, yeah? Like this moment, you know. Wow. And, yeah. yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. But that's one I, I don't think you see. I don't think I did see that for, in real. I think that I saw in the movie, I think. It's a, it's a moment. Um, someone uh, told me that you were um, one of my favorite singers. My wife used to own a club, like actually right next door to where we sit, called The Fine Line. And she booked Edie Burkell right before, right as her al first album was just oh, right. coming out. And you have something coming up with her? Yes, I just did an album with Steve Martin and Edie Burkell. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because people go, hmm, that's curious. But, you know, Steve, as you know, is a very accomplished banjo player, um, a really terrific banjo player. And, and quite apart from the stuff he does with his bluegrass band, which remains fairly traditional, um, he writes a lot of stuff on the banjo. Indeed, he did the music for last year's Shakespeare in the Park in New York. You know, he wrote all the incidental music on banjo. And he was working on some pieces, and Edie who's a friend of his, and um, uh, heard it and fell in love with it and ended up writing, suggesting some music melody lines on top and some lyrics. So Steve made some adjustments, and together they wrote these amazing songs. And um, I knew how good Steve was, because Steve's been a good friend of mine for a long time. And But Edie, even though I know her husband, Paul Simon, quite well, I didn't kn really know her, and just remembered, you know, the hit that we all know and yeah. the other records she's made since. But my God, is she a good singer. She was yeah. amazing. So we, uh, anyway, Steve, had, I was having dinner at Steve's house and he pl played these demos that she'd sent back to him. The, the beginning of the process was all, it was all done on uh, iPods and iPhones and stuff and sending things back and forth. And he'd send her the banjo parts and she'd play them and add on the vocal and send them back. And he played them to me and I gave him some suggestions about how some of these things could be done. And then flew back to LA and um, the following morning he sent me an email saying, do you want to produce the record? And I emailed back, yes, yes, yes. Literally, <laughs> literally that, uh, he kept the email. <coughs> so we did, I did, recorded the banjo and vocal all in New York and then added a whole lot of other stuff. It's not a bluegrass record. I mean, we, we used a fiddle and a mandolin on a couple of tracks, but we also used, I used a lot of piano and drums and electronic instruments and and, and sound effects, and it's 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 uh, interesting. I'm very proud of it. It comes out in uh, April on Rounder, but um, that was a fantastic experience. And also, of course, and this may mean nothing in this room, but to people of a certain age, you have to remember it is Stephen Eady. <laughs> oh my God. Does anybody know who Stephen Eady are? Oh, okay, Steve Lawrence and Eady Gourmet. Steve Lawrence and Eady Gourmet. Anybody? Immensely famous. The ED was spelled differently. It's the ED Gourmet spelled has with a Y in it. But uh, so we actually, you know, it is Steve Martin and ED Burkell in the same way the, they used to be Steve Lawrence and, and uh, ED Gourmet. Did you uh, meet um, Steve Martin's wife? Oh, yes, I know Anne very well, yes. She, my brother lives in New York. He's an author. They were a couple for a couple of years. She broke up with them, started dating Steve Martin. Ah. I still don't think he's over it. Ah, yeah. well, of course, I like the story where the older man wins <laughs> out, but... <laughs> <laughs> not immune to the charm of that. Yeah, exactly. It's great. There's hope for us all. He's still, to this day, he's like, oh, he's not that funny. Sure, John, he's not that funny. He's struggling. He's a struggling comedian. Right, exactly. He's funny and charming and rich and talented. But maybe that's not what you're looking for. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, random question. Uh, gun to your head, favorite drummer you've ever worked with in the studio? I'd have to say Russ Kunkel because Russ, you know, was the, the, the first major drummer I ever worked with in the studio, and he wasn't a major drummer at all. The Russ Kunkel story was I went out to, this was before we made the album that became Sweet Baby James. Um, I was, you know, this is when I'd left Apple, which is another story. They're all stories. <laughs> and in the show, the, you'll get, you get them all with video and audio and all kinds of little illustrations. I'd left Apple. We were coming to America to, to make the, the, uh, uh, um, an album for Warner Brothers. We'd got off Apple, and I was signing James to Warner Brothers. I dropped James off on the East Coast um, into a little rehab and um, <laughs> came out to L.A., made the deal with Warner Brothers, was looking for a band to put together. The people I knew I wanted to use was Danny Korchmar, who's a guitar player who features very largely in my career and James's career. Because Danny I first met when he played in a band called the King Bees that backed Peter and Gordon on the road on a couple of American tours. Danny's a brilliant player. Uh, Steve Cropper's his idol, which was good enough for me. Um, and he could play all these great Steve Cropper licks. But, and, um, then later on, he was in a band with James. I know this is a longer answer than you needed, but but he was in a band with James called The Flying Machine, broke up, James came to London. That's how we met. I'll get to that story later. But meantime, here I am headed to L.A. to make this album. Had a drummer. I'd also by this time met Carol King and become friends with her and had heard not only all the amazing songs she'd written, but had heard her demos of the songs she'd written and realized what a terrific pianist she was and how much I liked her accompanying style when she was accompanying her, her own songs. So I asked Carol if she would play piano on the, the record we were about to make, and she said yes, she would. We used a couple of different bass players, but I was in the quest for the perfect drummer. Now, back at that time, all the LA drummers were still trying to play like Hal Blaine. Hal Blaine, as some of you may know, is a genius drummer and there's this new movie about that whole group, yeah, you know, the, the Wrecking Crew, which I haven't seen yet. They did um, a showing here of it, a screening, and it's just... I hear it's I great. cried. <laughs> I hear it's amazing. Uh, Hal Blaine is a brilliant drummer, but he's quite a busy drummer. You know, he, he would do those, you know, big, amazing, impressive fills all over the place and stuff. He was terrific, is terrific, still around. Um, but I was looking for something entirely different. The way I was hearing this James record, I was looking for something much more sparse, and I went to a rehearsal by John Stewart. Now we're getting slightly more obscure. Anyone know who John Stewart is? Not the one who's on television, I need not add. Uh, he was a guy, he was in the Kingston Trio, um, uh, which was a very successful folk trio back then. He also wrote uh, a song that was a gigantic Turning hit. Turning music into gold? Was that the... Turning music, there's people out there turning music What's into gold. What's that? Is that his hit, big hit? Maybe I'm no, remembering wrong. No, he never had a big hit himself. He wrote a big hit for the Monkees. He wrote uh, the Believer song that the, is the one Neil Diamond didn't write. Let me get this right. I'm uh, a believer, a daydream believer? One, exactly. One uh, of them. <laughs> which one did Neil Diamond write? Um, thank you. You're right. He wrote I'm a believer. I shouldn't get a muddle up. Neil wrote I'm a believer. John Stewart wrote daydream Day believer. Da, 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 da. And I'm... Um, that one, great song. Anyway, so that was John, and he was in the Kingston Trio, then he was out on his own, had his own career. I went to a John Stewart rehearsal. He was prepared to go out on a club tour by himself. Heard this drummer who was so fantastically good. He was keeping perfect time, but playing really simply. He hadn't been listening to, to, uh, to Hal Blaine. He'd been listening to Ringo, you know? Mm. He'd been listening to simple, to the point, the kind of drumming where every fill is is a thing, you know, as a, is a melody, is a rhythm in and of itself. So I fell in love with him, and uh, drum wise, and uh, <laughs> asked him if he would come and play on this record I was about to make. Uh, he'd never been in the studio before. Well, he'd never done a session for anyone else before. He'd been in the studio once before in a band, got a single. So uh, he asked him. We we, re we rehearsed every day at my house, and uh, rehearsed three songs each day with Carol and Danny Korchmar and Russ, and um, then went in the studio that night and cut those three. And so we made the whole of Sweet Baby James in, in under two weeks. It cost 
and um, <laughs> and Russ's fills. If any of you remember the fills he played on Fire and Rain, mm. which were w we had him play brushes on that track, and there's those big gong 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 gong, gong fills Sound like thunder. that that are just amazing. So. I think because of that whole story and because Russ still is one of my favorite drummers and, and still plays brilliantly. Um, I don't know if anybody got to see a, a Buddy Holly special I did a couple of years ago. I did a PBS special tribute to Buddy Holly that I co-hosted with Chris Isaac. And that there was Russ in the band still playing as brilliantly as ever. I'll still use him anytime I can. So he is my favorite studio drummer. Partly because I love the way he plays and partly because he's a totally cool guy who's played such a big role in my life. I saw him play with Nicolette Larson at the fine line once, I think. Oh, that was his wife. They were married. Oh. They were married and then Nicolette tra great. tragically died of yeah. some horrible disease. Yeah. Yeah. She was they were he was great. Yeah. He's a fantastic He's drummer. an amazing, amazing drummer. Um, how about some of your favorite um, we'll do a, a couple more questions here and then we're gonna think of some um, hopefully inappropriate deep, dark, probing questions that from the audience here. So Please, yeah. <coughs> Nothing embarrassing yet. Let's go. I'm doing my best and <laughs> just striking out here. Um, I tried to hit you with Courtney Love last time, and I got nothing. So. Oh. Um, well, no, I never did. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course. There's that British politeness again. No, anyway, um, my f question was, any of your... Uh, people out there right now that are producing records, besides uh, Bruno Mars producing his own records, that you think, I'm just wondering your thoughts on Mark Ronson or any of the producers out there right now that are making records that are some of your yeah, favorites. Yeah, Mark is brilliant. I love his records. He's terrific. I, I know him vaguely. Um, the way I know, it's fine, an awful lot of people I know now because I know their parents, you know, it's, a, <laughs> it's what happens. Um, I know Mark Ronson's mom very well, uh, Anne. Um, and... Uh, and my daughter Victoria is very good friends with Samantha Ronson, who, who and um, they're a great, brilliant family. I mean, Mark has made some astoundingly good records. Yeah. I've never watched him work or anything. I'd love to, but I mean, the funny thing is, producers tend to end up knowing very little about exactly what each other do or how they do it, you know. But he's—I know he plays a bit as well, and he's spectacular. He's—I I admire him enormously. There's so many good, good records. I mean, I like. Uh, I admire the records Dr. Luke makes. I, adm I admire the records that uh, Stargate make, you know. I mean, it's a different kind of record making. But I mean, yeah. like my favorite Katy Perry record is Firework, which I think is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's so intense. And just when you think it can't get any more intense and more catchy, it does, you know. And uh, the sounds on there are great. And, you know, it's, it's a... So, I mean, I, I, I love hit singles. I love modern huge hit singles. I, the only kind I don't like some of them where there really is virtually no melody. But I mean, yeah. a lot of the ones that you dismiss as kind of lightweight pop music, um, you know, when you actually listen carefully to the song, there's some amazing songs in there, you know? It's like, I don't know if anyone remembers that Travis, you, know, you remember Travis? Great band. Uh, Fran Healy, who's the lead singer of that band, used to do a version of Hit Me Baby One More Time, acoustically. And all it did was prove what a really good song it is, you know, because he'd start off the song, and it'd be a long time before you realized what it was. Because, you know, you start, my loneliness is killing me, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, until you get to the, hit me, baby, and then we're going, oh, it's that song, you know. <laughs> but before then, you're going, what a beautiful, mournful you know, sing a songwriter song, that is. And the, the base of a lot of these, you know, super thumping records is a really good song, otherwise they wouldn't work. So what other producers? Um, God, so many. T-Bone's a friend of mine, I admire his work enormously. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we have got to watch each other work a bit because we're in the same town and we're friends. But I'm trying to think, he's, he's actually been working with Elton Lately, they've, 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 they're making a record together, which is certainly fantastic. Did he do the Elton to Leon record? Yes, he did. Record? Yes, yeah. he did. Yeah, he did. I'm a huge Leon Russell fan. I just <laughs> yeah, as of course is Elton. I mean, it, that was Elton's hero. You know, that's all he wanted to do was meet Leon Russell when he came to America. Okay. Um, so uh, oh, really, God, we only just started. Okay. Uh, any uh, questions? We got time for. Uh, 
he, you're only about five, ten minutes at the most away from your, your radio interview. So if we can get a, one. What time are we supposed to be at the radio thing? We're supposed to be downstairs at the Oh, okay. All right. Who's got a great question? Question. Someone come run up here and. Uh, or just or just yell. Yell your you question know. into this microphone. That was my instructions from my superior, from one of my superiors. I'm going to get one question here. You got to say your question into this microphone. Apparently, right you here. have to be recorded Sorry. for posterity. Protocol. <clears throat> oh. More about Apple. Yes. Um, it was fascinating, of course. I mean, Paul and I had been talking about Apple, the company, for, for a long time because he had these ideas. And as, as it grew nearer, first he asked me if I would produce some records for Apple because he'd watched me produce some stuff. He'd even played on a couple of tracks I'd produced, which is yet another story I could tell. But um, so then, and, and when it became real and they launched it as Apple, I was head of A&R for the label by that time. And, you know, they'd officially invited the public to send in tapes and scripts or whatever. And we got thousands. So I had a, a team of assistants sorting through all this stuff. Uh, the tragedy is that out of the thousands of tapes we that came in, there was not one thing that was really interesting. There was tons of really, really awful stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what people will think is worth sending in, you know, just insane lyrics with no music. I mean, will the, we want, will the Beatles please write music to my lyrics and stuff like that? But, um, and then I would have an A&R meeting once a week with as many Beatles as, as could be bothered to attend or were in town. And, and discuss all these various submissions. And we never signed any of them. The people we signed all came one way or another in-house. Paul found this girl, Mary Hopkin, uh -huh. on a TV talent show. And his genius was that he knew straight away that he wanted to produce her first single and he knew what song he was gonna do. He'd heard the song, Those Were the Days, that you may remember. He'd heard it in a nightclub some months previously and made a mental note of it. Turned out to be an old Russian folk song with English lyrics. I'm sure you remember, you know, the, those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end, which when you think about it, does sound like a Russian folk song. And he recorded that with Mary and went to number one. George Harrison found Jackie Lomax, who was an R&B singer, who was a friend of his, made a really good record. Um, we signed this band, the Ivies, who Mal Evans, the uh, Beatles, road manager brought in, and later we changed their name to Badfinger, and they went on to achieve huge success. And of course, I found James Taylor. Joey Mullen lives here in Minneapolis, actually. Fantastic, yeah, yeah. Joey, Joey Mullen's a, a pal, and, and uh, Badfinger's a, a, a significant band. Yeah. And, and as I say, I found and brought in James, and we signed him. And it was, it, you know, it, there's all the books that have been written, and there's so many of them, um, obviously emphasized the madness that went on, and there was some. But people do forget that we did actually put make some pretty decent records and get them out and sell them successfully during that same period. Most of Apple's problems were when they went into areas other than music. Clothing and electronics, they had this total charlatan called Magic Alex who invented all this stuff that didn't work. And, and uh, the John and George both believed in him. Um, and uh, stuff like that. And then, then of course, when Alan Klein came in, that's a whole other chapter to the story because he was a villainous bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's hear it for villainous bastards. I want to thank you for coming again. I remind everyone, this is fun, but if you really, really want to have a good time, get your butt down to the Dakota tomorrow night or the night after that. You won't regret it. It's an amazing show, and you'll have the time of your life. So thanks and to We're going to see if, we, if there's any such thing as a kind of student discount or something. I have no idea. but I really do think there is. Um, I, I shall, if there isn't, we shall endeavor to create one. But one way or the other, it would be great to see. And, and half the fun of doing these shows also, by the way, is that I do hang around afterwards and talk to everybody. And you know, So there will be another, yet another opportunity for unanswered questions because I, I do sign stuff and talk and... But that's why I like playing it in, in small club places. We can actually meet the whole audience, or as much of the audience. Obviously, if somebody walked out and discussed and didn't like it, <laughs> you don't. You're happy. That guy. You don't meet them, but 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 you meet all the other people. All right. Well, thanks again for coming, and thanks to you guys for coming.